Now, system readiness status, the INM readiness status, it's information that's displayed for the inspection maintenance flags. The system status identifies whether the OBD2 system has run the vehicle's emission control test. This supplies information about the status of the monitors. You're going to use it to determine if the monitors have completed, have they passed, have they failed. When we look at this scan tool here, here's an auto ingenuity scan tool. This is, we use it because it's very easy to grab the um, screens like this one off the PC and put them into our videos. Now when we look at this particular screen on the AE, we're looking right here. This gives us our onboard monitoring system. And we'll blow it up here so you can see it. You can see, reading down the left side, those are the monitors. And on the right side, we're saying that they're completed that they're done, they have finished. Of course the ones in the yellow not supported, meaning the vehicle that we chose to do the demo on does not have a heated cat, secondary air, or an AC system monitor. Now when we look up here into this readiness screen, sometimes we'll see not complete or failed. This is cause for concern and this is what's going to lead our diagnostics. You want to check the enabling conditions when a monitor hasn't run. What makes this monitor run? What condition of the vehicle will cause this vehicle to run? If you're not meeting enabling conditions, that's why you're not running, in this case, the misfire monitor. Or that it has diagnostic trouble codes blocking that monitor. When we look here, the fuel system monitor failed. It just failed. It means it's running too rich or too lean from this monitor uh, status screen, we can't tell if it's running too rich or too lean. We only know that we need to go test the fuel system. Now down here the oxygen sensor monitor passed and it's completed. Now look at that. Now just for a moment, think about your having a drivability concern in your service bay and you're on the readiness screen and this is what you're seeing. You're seeing that the oxygen sensor monitor passed but the fuel system failed. So when you look at this screen, what is it really telling you? It's telling you to go test fuel control and fuel delivery. Why? Because the oxygen sensor monitor ran, it completed, and it passed. By it passing tells us that the oxygen sensors are good. How good? We don't know, but good enough that the computer didn't fail the oxygen sensors. And we know that we have to have a good oxygen sensor to have good fuel control. And it's the feedback system for the PCM, the OBD2 software that runs fuel. So when we see something like this, this screen right here, we pushed a few buttons sitting in the front seat of the car and it says fuel system failed, oxygen sensor is good, you can bypass testing the oxygen sensors because the computer likes those oxygen sensors. If it didn't like them, it would say failed. If it never ran them, it would say not complete. And then if you saw fuel system failed and oxygen sensor monitors not complete, you'd have to start testing with the oxygen sensors to see why that monitor didn't run. Diagnostic trouble codes, you know, working with these codes can identify the system or component that the PCM tested and set a fault for. Simply looking at DTCs limit the information that needs to be studied. I mean, just because you get a P0123 telling you that the TPS voltage isn't right, it doesn't tell you what to do. But adding that information from that DTC to the rest of your diagnostics points you in the right direction. Now, on our screen here, we can see that we have some different diagnostic trouble codes. We actually have the P0101, and that says the MAF signal does not match, and it tells us that it's in the module, the PCM. Now, that's good news. Does not match what? We don't know at this point because we'll have to go look up a better and stronger definition for P0101. But we know that the math at this point needs to be tested. And also, our P0112 tells us our inlet air temperature signal is too high. Now, this diagnostic code is more specific. It's telling us that we have a signal that's too high and that's in the PCM. Now this particular B1467 
isn't a drivability concern. It's wiper high low speed circuit. There's something wrong with it and it was generated in the BCM not the PCM. Now this information is only going to be available. Diagnostic trouble codes are only going to be available if a monitor ran and failed. It can be a single trip DTC, a two trip DTC. The enabling conditions must be met before that monitor can run. Let's say it uh, this way also. The enabling conditions must be met before the fault can be set. Now, enabling conditions is how, what condition must this vehicle be meeting in order to run a monitor or to run a test inside a monitor and set a diagnostic trouble code. Now when we look at enabling conditions for a misfire monitor, we have entry conditions, and we're going to have minimum and maximum, and then we're going to have time since start, engine temp, RPM, profile factor, fuel level. Now this is some of the things, some of the enabling conditions that have to be met in order to run a misfire monitor. For example, pro profile factor there has to be yes. That means the computer has to have learned the small variations in the crankshaft position sensor in order to meet the enabling conditions to run the monitor. So you got to make, when a monitor doesn't run, you have to look up the enabling conditions and see which one you're not meeting. Or is it a diagnostic trouble code blocking that monitor for, from running? Here are P0106 enabling conditions, and it's a map sensor. Change was more than three tenths of a volt with steady throttle and engine speed. So we had a steady throttle, we had steady engine speed, and a map sensor signal started fluctuating more than 330 millivolts here. The enabling conditions for the computer to find this and set that fault would be that has to have engine speed stable within 150 RPM for 400 milliseconds. The idle air control was stable within 10 counts for 400 milliseconds. Throttle angle was stable within 1% of that same time. The EGR position did not change and within that time map signal changed more than 330 millivolts. In Decimal zero one six seconds, sixteen milliseconds. Now another enabling conditions as we were talking about before. There are no codes in this case, no specific codes of P zero one zero seven or P zero one zero eight. These are the conditions that the vehicle has to meet in order for the computer to run a part of the monitor in order to set this P zero one zero six. The P0107 and 108, the 107 is the signal's too low. The, you, you really need to pay attention to this data value so you know the nature of the failure and what data values that you're looking for. Now the P0108 is the opposite. It's too high. You have to pay attention. When you see a 107 and a 108, that means you possibly could have a P0106. Why? Because the P0106 has an enabling condition that there has to be no P0107s or 108s and if there is that part of the test won't run and you won't set the P0106. So when you're looking at diagnostic trouble codes just reading a short definition sometimes limits your diagnostics. Knowing and understanding the enabling conditions will help much more. When, If a fault's recognized, a diagnostic DTC will be stored in memory. Now this is critical because it seems like a very simple statement. If a fault is recognized, well what if it's not recognized? In the example we were just giving, the P0106 would not be recognized, if there was a fault there, it would not be recognized because a P0107 or 108 was set. So it's not that, the you, you, many times people say, why, why didn't I set a trouble code? Well, I would think majority of the time it's because the enabling conditions weren't met. Now the SAE standard for the DTCs is the same as it's always been for OBD2, it's the J2012. Any circuit anomaly,
detected will cause a DTC to set. Circuit anomalies are a continuity check, open shorts to ground, and shorts to power. Now, these are the things that can go wrong that will cause a DTC to set. Let's look at some scan data here. We've blown up the small reading so we can see it here on the screen. The engine coolant temperature sensor reads 304 degrees Fahrenheit, and the inlet air temperature reads 77 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, sitting here viewing this training, you don't really know how hot that engine is, and you don't really know the air temperature. But just use some common sense. That's the first and foremost step in looking at data. The engine coolant temperature sensor, 304 degrees. You know, the only thing I can go along with that is steam. This engine is boiling over and it's steam all over, and you're not going to work on it anyway. Inlet air temperature sounds pretty normal. You know, is this normal is the question. Is this normal? Now, let's look at it just the opposite. Engine coolant temperature at minus 37 degrees with the inlet air temperature staying the same at 77 degrees. You know, is this normal? When you look at this stuff, is the 304 to 37 or somewhere in between normal? Misfires at cold start can be caused by ETC signals that indicate a warm engine temperature, with, uh, and that's reducing fuel for startup. And if it's a cold startup, we can get a lean misfire. So looking at data, you want to determine, is it normal or not? engine coolant temperature sensor does is too high. If you set a DTC for this and your data says 304 uh, degrees Fahrenheit, the PCM's doing its job. Now, what is its job? What are we talking about? It's doing its job. Sure, it found a fault, but let's just dig a little deeper here. The inlet air temperature was normal a P0112 or 113 uh, is not present, and those are IAT DTCs. Now, think about all the computer thinking that went on here. It said that, okay, engine coolant temperature sensor out of range. Wait a minute. Let's compare it to the inlet air temperature, and that's what we do diagnostically, and there's no codes present, so in this case, it's saying, the PCM saying, the monitor, the software inside the PCM, is saying that the engine coolant temperature sensor is high, and it's too high. It's not within normal range, and the inlet air temperature is normal. The ETC has been high for over 15 seconds. Startup engine temperature was 304. You know, engine coolant temperature sensor at 304, we detected a fault. We have seen a fault. Now, when we look at this, the ETC was too high for too long. We had a P0117 set. It's going to attach a freeze frame to that diagnostic trouble code. It's going to block these monitors we see at the bottom here, fuel control O2, CAT, misfire, CAN purge, and, of course, the EGR monitor. These monitors are not going to run. Why? because we've set a P0117. We're blocking those monitors from running. So when you're on the INM readiness status uh, page of your uh, scan tool, they're going to say not completed. So what are you going to see when something like this happens to the car that's in your stall? You're going to, of course, see inside the DTC that the P0117 is saying that the ECT is too high. Now, a rationality check tells us that inputs are checked for rationality. Each input is compared against other import, inputs, and that's what we're saying here. This computer is saying, my IAT, my inlet air temperature sensor, doesn't have any faults, so I'm going to believe that, and I'm going to compare, compare the ECT, which is 304 degrees. They don't compare, so that's not rational. Right. Not only the inputs, but stored information is going to be compared to and see if the signal makes sense under certain current conditions. You know, So look at this here. Here's a different example right here in some data that we've blown up on a scan tool. Mass air volts is 3.9. TPS is 1.9. Engine speed is 2,108. Are these values normal? You know, Are these rational? All right. When you look at the outputs, the functionality check is what we're going to work with. But when we're on diagnostic trouble codes, we're going to work with data and rationality. Now, 
is this data real? I mean, does 1.9 TPS look too low for what's happening? And if the computer sets a TPS rationality code, then yes, it's not right. But the truth is, when you look at this data here, without input from the PCM, you're not so sure what's right and what's wrong. And that's why looking at all the data, mode 6, mode 5, you're looking at PIDs, mode 1, and you're making sure that the monitors are clicking off. They're running normally. you got to make sure that there are no faults noted in all the different scan data screens. And let's go back to this functionality test because outputs are checked for functionality where the inputs are checked for rationality. When the output is commanded on or off, the PCM verifies that the command was carried out by an input signal voltage or current changes. You know, when you do something, when you take a hammer and hit it against the window, you expect to hear breaking glass. That's functionality. So here's desired idle speed at 750 RPM. The IAC is at 90% and engine speed is lower than the desired speed and it's 440, 545 RPM. Now when you look at this, could a gross vacuum leak cause this? Now think, think before you say this, you know, no it couldn't, could it? Because when you look at a desired RPM and the engine speeding less than that and the computer IEC trying to bring that low up, that's certainly not a vacuum leak. You're not going to get a too lean condition code set on this for functionality. Could a, a, a gross vacuum leak cause us? No. Now here's what a gross vacuum leak would look like. To, same three bits of data. Desired idle speed stayed at 750 RPM. This time the engine speed's higher than desired. And it's too high. So what is the IAC doing? It's closing, trying to bring the engine speed down to the desired speed. Now this makes sense. So when you look at functionality and see functionality faults, you can understand that the computer uses exactly the same knowledge that you would use to diagnose these systems.